is there some report with that with that said? I think sure. you there's there's actually an enormous number of reports. So what's the point? There's an enormous number of reports that exist putting out the same privatization plan. They get less and less honest as you get closer to date. They all put the same plan out, but in the early ones they explain it clearly, whereas and the they the conclusions are very kind of fuzzy in the more recent ones. They don't give any specifics. But the earlier ones, you can see very clearly, I've got ones back to 1957. The plan is to introduce charging in the NHS and have the insurance run, industry run it. So uh, in the early 80s, there were a bunch of contributions from the pharmaceutical industry and so forth, saying how they'd like the NHS to be, and those got put into Tory party policy. They were worked out by privatisation specialists from Rothschild's bank named Oliver Letwin and John Redwood. Holy. John Redwood is also yeah. interestingly part of the No Turning Back group in Parliament, which is keen to get us out of the EU and into the United States. So that's where we need to be a bit careful with UKIP, because the idea is that once we're out of the EU, we can go and be one of the states. So John Redwood is part of that, and he's the Rothschild's man, and so is Oliver Letwin. They did the technical stuff on it and they wrote up some populist pamphlets and also the Adam Smith Institute was commissioned to do a thorough write-up. That is called the Health of Nations, 1988. There's also the Health Alternatives in 1988 and two other pamphlets. And between them, those describe in detail what has been done to the NHS ever since, right up to the next few years where the insurance industry takes the lot. PFI is in there. All of the all of the central three <coughs> organisations are explained in detail in that report. It's global empire, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I think you're amazing. Thank you. Oh yeah, definitely. Great. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, would you like to say a little bit about how much, um, how many ex-Labour ministers, how many ex-Labour MPs who are peers, how many Lib Dem funding, and how many Tory peers? work for the private in health industry, especially the Labour ministers are working for the private health and doing delivering the, the agenda you've, you've just outlined. Sure. Um, in terms of keeping the privatisation on stream, it is enormously helpful, surely, that many of the people who work in there are making money out of it personally. There's a journalist uh, who has put together something called Social Investigations Blog, and that contains a listing of are MPs and Lords who have conflicts of interest around healthcare privatisation. It isn't a complete list, it doesn't contain insurance company links so much, it doesn't contain all the private equity links. It's a very incomplete list and yet you will discover that pretty much every one of them is in like a dirty shirt. So that is one method of stopping democracy actually working. They have induced people who are already in there to take interests which are in conflict with NHS privatisation. <coughs> okay, good one. Okay, I'll carry on. Okay, so... Uh, one, one. Um, Do you think that's sensitive? Yeah, exactly. So, Right, yes, so, um, so Social Investigations blog gives you a partial listing of who it is that's got inappropriate interests. Party fundraising has operated for some years, and I know in particular the Liberal Democrats have been officially in trouble over this, for putting people into the Lords who are, for example, there's, there's one Liberal Democrat peer who put in, as a Liberal Democrat peer, one of his clients, um, and he is in the care sector. So they have been deliberately stuffing the Lords with people who would vote for privatisation rather than against it. We have been rather fooled where it came to getting rid of the aristocrats because some of the aristocrats were you know, actually trying to do the right thing, whereas now we've got a bunch of, of privatisation insiders taking those votes. Then you have got the system of the whips, uh, whereby nobody gets put into a safe seat to be elected into a safe seat unless they are utterly controllable. And when the whip comes around and says, you're voting this way on this issue, they go, yes, sir. Because otherwise their personal life is liable to unravel. So I think we've probably seen some of the things that's used to make people blackmailable. It would appear that nobody who is not under strict control actually gets in that place. And you can see it from the health and social care votes. 
because they all voted strictly among party lines among, apart from a handful of rebels. Really few people rebelled. And it's because they don't vote their conscience, as, as we're told in the system. They do what the whips say. And what the whips say is what the city says, and so that's where the decisions come from. Um, Furthermore, can I give that to you, please? I don't want to put it down because it gets wet. But I copied something from a City of London website the other day because I was staggered by the implications of it. And so I want to give it you from the horse's mouth. <coughs> OK, so this is from cityoflondon.gov.uk and it's about one of their key officer positions called the Remembrancer. The current Remembrancer is Paul Double, who is a barrister. The office was created in 1571. It acts as a channel of communication between Parliament and the city. In the contemporary context, this means day-to-day -day examination of parliamentary business, including examination of and briefing on proposed legislation and amendments to it, regular liaison with the select committees of both houses, and contact with officials in government departments dealing with parliamentary bills. <laughs> liaison is also maintained with the city office in Brussels and other member states' permanent representations in relation to draft EU legislation. That office has existed since 1571, and it means the city's got an override on all of our laws yeah. and any changes to them. So all of this big belief we've all got that we vote for representatives and they make our laws, well, that doesn't seem to have been true for 500 years. No, it isn't. And actually, it's Occupy uh, Democracy Policy to scrap the role of Rembrandt, sir. So, yeah. yeah. Good. And so there's uh, yeah, Remembrancer, but, and also Remember Green Party. Yes, uh, private members will buy uh, Karen Lucas to get rid of them. I think that's what done now. It's worth, it's worth keeping in mind, actually, that if you look back to our democracy that was created around about the 1600s, it was created by the City of London as a leading institution. So really, it was it was the leading capitalist at that time. So we've never really had a proper democracy, even though it's got worse. We've never, it's an illusion to think we ever did. Okay. Okay. Um, about three or four years, around, around about 2000. Uh, please speak up. Sorry. Around about 2000, all of the data for telephones, etc., started being captured in central data. Louder, louder, louder. Sorry. Shout! Uh, about 2000, all of the data for telephone records, etc., was starting to be collated in the big giant databases by consultancies, right? About three or four years later, I, I remember <laughs> there was a lot of talk about the patient records centralised system. Mm -hmm. And at that point, none of this was very sinister to me at all. So I kind of know that project went ahead and all of it was centralised. So, but most of that is managed in private hands or was created and designed by private hands. So why, what makes you say that it's not in private hands? Why, why, why do we say the data isn't in private hands? Well, you may be talking about the hospital records database, which has already been exported to industry. What's up, up for grabs at the moment is the GPs, and not all of those have been exported into a central database because there were protests. I mean, they've possibly done it anyway, but certainly the, the official line was that they were going to do it and we were all supposed to be happy about it. And a lot of people expressed the opinion that they were not happy about it. So, you know, to quiet people down, they said that they weren't going to. And it's going to be real or some other way. So they're just going to try and trick us into it another way or go behind our back and do it. Certainly, the insurance industry really wants that data. And the insurance industry has got very deep pockets. And this lot seems to be up for sale. So okay. we believe currently that it's not centralised in privately held databases, or do we believe it is centralised in privately held databases, but it's not been he uh, handed out for private use? Because it can be held in private databases only for government use, because the contract between the private company that does the database and the government is, is solely for that government use. Well, it's very difficult to know because, unfortunately, the data harvesters are all the way through the Department of Health, including Tim Kelsey, who is in the data harvesting game and is formerly with McKinsey. So the people within the system have been trying to export our data for years. So you may well be absolutely right about it, but it hasn't been announced that way. And I would say that certainly something is still up for grabs because people are making attempts to get it still. So I couldn't tell you specifically what it is they're after and what's, what's up for grabs. 
but clearly there are attempts to be grabbing some data and they are interested in our medical records and the reason is, well I mean that's saleable to many people for many reasons, but the insurance industry is especially needing it. Uh, what's the most positive, practical thing that keeps you going that you can think of that is, can... Uh... Instead of giving up? Yeah. Sure, Just... okay, right. Um, I started doing this in 2011 when somebody pointed out there was a health bill and I read it and it's a privatisation bill. I know that because I used to do privatisations. And then I got very, very frustrated because everybody seemed to believe a whole load of rubbish about the whole thing and it seemed impossible to be able to get the truth out because everybody had been hearing for years and years and years and they got into the way of thinking about what the privatisers said was true. And at the time we couldn't get any traction with the truth. Three years on, a lot of people know a lot of things about it. Networks have developed that never existed before. Network. And, you know, we are, I know we're a couple of years behind schedule. They have done everything they could, clean and dirty, to push this through as fast as they could because they know it needs its momentum. Yeah. We have already slowed it down by a couple of years. Yeah. I hear from a guy I know that went to work in recruitment in the city that the health sector is considered to be poison. We should stop petitioning the MPs and we should be targeting the city because the market is really flighty. What little we've been able to do on that front, and frankly Richard Branson and Virgin are your top target, because he's got a big diversified set of businesses, a little foray into the NHS, he's got big advertising and marketing budgets supporting the rest of it. If the NHS bit turns nasty and blows up in his face with bad publicity, his best bet is to cut, cut his losses, dump it and publicise that he's dumped it. And if he does that, it will poison an awful lot of foreign interest. We should absolutely be going for the commercial line on this. That lot are sold out. There's no point pleading with them, they're dirty. If you're not prepared to, to use, we're going to put you in jail if you don't do it clean, then forget about them and go after the commercial line of things. Because that is jumpy, we've seen that already. So. The truth is getting out. It's been hard, but it's getting easier. That has to be the thing we do. That's the thing that has impact. So the more we do of that, the better. And we can see that we are getting some traction in some ways, even though we've been systematically led to do the wrong kinds of things previously. And what can, what can, what can individuals do? Uh, how can individuals... Well, same thing. Support her. Emails. <laughs> Yeah. Social media. I'm spelling it out. You can uh, get get at any professional communicators. You can obviously, especially journalists, but anybody that's prepared to get on their back legs and talk about things in a systematic manner, honestly, is worth educating to get them to understand what's happening and to get the word out to people because they are putting enormous money into PR campaigns to lie to us. But the truth has got legs, so what we need to do is to be talking to each other. So if you can do your very best to educate the journalists first, and then anybody else that's a professional communicator, <coughs> teachers and so forth as well, writers, broadcasters, artists, anybody that's a communicator is definitely worth targeting, but actually just everybody. Okay, thank you. Would you yeah. do on that note, would you be able to do a quick like sound like 30 seconds or one minute sort of yeah, summary yeah, that we can all just share on YouTube and Facebook and whatnot yeah, and Twitter. to yeah. give everyone a sort of brief rundown? We could give you a minute to think, give you like, you know, a few minutes to think about it or something. Okay, bye guys. Uh, yeah, keep tooting this, uh, three videos. I'm posting up to YouTube later on. Thank you so much and I'll be back shortly. Can you cut the sound bites out of it and just...